end of the morning lecture and I'll be happy to answer questions. I'm only showing you examples from our work, but many other people have done this kind of work. Um, This is a, a, a steam turbine. Uh, this is one of my PhD students. Uh, she's called Tracy Cool. And she's um, 1.7 meters in height. No, that's too big. <laughs> I, I think she's about 5 feet 10 inches. Correct? Uh, 5 feet 10 inches in height. So you can understand the scale of this. And, you know, the outfit that she's wearing is not to protect her clothes, but to protect the turbine in case her, something falls out and imbalances the turbine, okay? Because this is going to rotate at 3,000 revolutions per minute with steam temperatures of 600 degrees centigrade. And if it breaks, then pieces of metal will go several miles in many directions, okay? Uh, so, the design of the creep resistant steel is a very important problem because we want to increase the steam temperature even higher than 600 degrees centigrade because that increases the thermodynamic efficiency. Uh, the thermodynamic efficiency depends on the difference between the highest temperature and the lowest temperature in the operating cycle divided by that minus zero. So if I can, I can't really reduce the lowest temperature because water becomes frozen. Yeah? Uh, I can increase the highest temperature. You know, it used to be 400 degrees centigrade decades ago. It's now approximately 560 degrees and 600 in modern plant. We want to go very, very high, as high as possible. Uh, because for the same amount of oil or coal, you can produce more electricity. So there are, there's big research going on in many, many countries on designing metallic alloys which will operate at even higher temperatures. And of course, you need welding materials as well. And When we started this particular project, the engineers set the targets that we must have this much strength, we must have this much ultimate tensile strength, this much elongation, and this much toughness. Yeah. 
and using a whole variety of models, we made a prediction. And then they designed the welding electrodes, and when the welding electrodes were actually made, in every single case, we achieved the engineering properties without doing any experiment. Okay? But being in a university, we did more experiments than was necessary. Okay? And we came across a problem. So, after welding, you have to do a heat treatment at a high temperature to get rid of stresses. Yeah. And they, they told us that this heat treatment should be at 600 degrees centigrade. Okay. Now, we, we have no problem. We, we, we achieve the yield strength for 600 degrees centigrade. Uh, and the agreement between the calculation and experiment is not bad. But you can see it becomes very poor when we go to 700 degrees centigrade. You know, really poor prediction of the properties. Yeah. And we didn't understand why. So we did a very simple experiment. So this is exactly the microstructure we expected. Don't worry about the details. And this is exactly what we expected after 600 degrees tempering after 650 degree temperature, but the region where we get very bad agreement between theory and experiment, something strange is happening. Yeah? This is recrystallization. And in our models, there is no theory for recrystallization. So it's not surprising that they don't predict it. So by doing this experiment, we discovered the problem and we added a small amount of vanadium to pin the boundaries and then produce the commercial welding electrodes. So, th this is an interesting example because the theory failed and it led to a critical experiment and a solution. So sometimes it doesn't work but it can still give interesting information. And there are now many, many examples like this. Both of success and failure. <laughs> yeah, of course. After after we discover that it fails, we can do that. But you know, we didn't even think about this problem when we were doing the research. There's another case like that where we designed a creep resistant alloy, but we forgot to think about oxidation. So the question is that, look, we have this uh, acicular ferrite, which is really intragranularly indicated veinite. Okay? And in yesterday's talk, uh, I said we can produce extremely fine veinite, 20 nanometers, by transforming at a very low temperature. Okay? Now, I think the problem is as follows, why we can't do that with acicular ferrite, is that a well metal 
has to be tough as soon as it is deposited. That means the carbon concentration has to be very low. Almost all valve mantles have a carbon concentration less than 0.1 weight percent. That means that the transformation temperature will never be as low as with the bainite I talked about yesterday, which is, you know, 125 degrees centigrade. Here, the transformation temperature is more like 500 degrees centigrade. Yeah. So I can't uh, immediately think of a way of making that fine. And the other, other thing is, of course, that the strength would go up enormously. Uh, now, here, typically, the strength is, the required strength, is 600 megapascals. If you make it two and a half gigapascals, you will have other problems. You see, you will have mismatch of strength between the plate and the valve metal. And that will cause a big problem because it's like having a hard region and a soft region. You will focus strain in the, in the heat affected zone, for example, and cause other problems. equation doesn't need correction. I, I don't understand. Okay, you based on the second figure term. You know, yeah. we have we have short slides say that the west uh, when you upper and you can on the top. So the right. On the, right. So the, the, the thread is in the Okay. Abrami already has corrected for that because if I add up all these dark blue areas, I get the wrong change in volume fraction. But if I multiply that by the probability of finding untransformed austenite, then I get the true change in volume fraction. Yeah. So this is the major achievement of Abrami that he multiplies by the probability of finding untransformed material. And it's very, very clever. I think. Once you do that, you correct for errors like this, or even when two particles are growing into each other. Thermodynamics deals with equilibrium. Okay. Uh, we can also deal with constrained equilibrium. For example, if manganese is not diffusing but carbon is diffusing, then you can still do a phase diagram calculation, a modified phase diagram for what's known as para equilibrium. Okay. You can also calculate the free energy of martensite, which is not an equilibrium phase, and compare it with the free energy of austenite and therefore work out a margin size start temperature. The only thing that would be completely missing is time dependence. But then you can put thermodynamics into kinetics. Yeah, so for example, if you are working out the growth rate of the phase, yeah, so let's imagine that this is ferrite, which is growing in austenite and I'm plotting the carbon concentration here. 
then this point here comes from the phase diagram, <coughs> and this point here comes from the phase diagram as well. So thermodynamics, you know, kinetics, you can't do without having the thermodynamics. And you combine the two and you also get the time dependence. Without thermodynamics, we could not do any kinetic calculations. And the other thing is, it also sets the rules. You know, if the free energy change is not negative, then it's impossible for the reaction to happen. So you can say what direction the reaction can happen or not happen. Does that roughly answer? Um, roughly. <coughs> I, uh, I just wonder if you consider temporal composition as a primary uh, parameter of the uh, model. Uh, how about the microstructure and the uh, physical gravity uh, and so on? Will yeah. come into issue? Should be coming into uh, pegging uh, uh, upstream? Yeah. yeah. No, you are right. So th this has uh, no crystallography in it. Yeah? Uh, now, the crystallography comes in uh, because we will have strain energy depending on orientation. Okay? So we have strain energy. The interface energy will depend on crystallography. What else? You know, so you, you can actually incorporate crystallography if you know the details. And there are people who try to predict crystallographic texture, for example, you know, as a function of deformation and so forth. So to some extent it can be done. You know. I mean, it, there's nothing, nothing uh, wrong, but to summarize what electron theory can do and what it can't do, okay. number one is that uh, you can calculate elastic properties. Properties to probably plus or minus five percent accuracy, which is quite good. Yeah. So you can calculate modulus in different directions and so forth uh, for different crystal structures. Yeah. Uh, number two, you, you can calculate uh, thermal properties. Um, uh, you could calculate surface energy. the stable crystal structure. Now, the biggest problem is that you're limited to small numbers of atoms. So, if you are talking about a disordered solution, it really isn't practical. So if you look at all the papers on first principle calculations, if they are looking at, uh, let's say, a, a nickel-aluminium solution, then they'll be looking at Ni3Al or Ni-Al, okay? but not looking at uh, Ni1.1Al0.9, which is like a solid solution. Okay? So it's very limited, I think, in what it can do. And also temperature effects. Most of these calculations are at zero Kelvin. Actually, not for this uh, Yeah. I mean, uh, again, you know, things like dislocation, the scale is too large to do a meaningful calculation.
but take a looking at the core structure of a dislocation, then that can be done because it's a very small number of factors. All of the methods, Yang, they have limitations. Yeah. So even you know thermodynamics or kinetics or microstructure or finite elements. So we just need to know in which region to use each method. Yeah.